So today I would like to uh, welcome uh, Timothy Bonabrek, who came, like he's based in Hong Kong, but he came only from England, where he is based now, uh, for his, uh, what is it, how is it called, anyway. Um, <laughs> oh my gosh, uh, the word, <laughs> what's about <laughs> Yeah, uh, so it was a long travel, but not so long. And he's going to talk about the climate change and its effect on insect, uh, what they should be doing. And uh, I have one person to welcome also. Uh, we have here today uh, Thomas Bourguignon for the first time. Uh, he uh, received the Gutter Grant in this round and he will be starting his research at the department since January. And because we have next week, Wednesday, official welcoming of the new laboratory of uh, Peter Nguyen and uh, Thomas will not be here anymore because he flies back to Okinawa. Yeah, uh, so he's here only from Okinawa arrived yesterday and he's coming back soon. So um, we will see him again in January in person around. So these are all the people we have around. Um, thanks very much, uh, Timothy, uh, your well, Gloria's yours. I can't speak. Thanks so <laughs> It's great to be here. It's great to have this opportunity to talk to you about my research. And it's even better because uh, Benita covered a lot of the topics we we'll be talking about today. Um, so I don't have to repeat a lot, which is really nice. Um, and I think it, it serves as kind of a natural flow in this conversation about climate change and tropical insects. And so that's what I want to kind of talk about and think about, think through this, this question about whether we should expect tropical insects to be resilient to climate change or whether we can expect a ruinous demise. So just kind of starting off with insect declines, um, you can choose your favorite uh, perspective review paper. Uh, there are lots of them. I, I like lots of them. And But I think the, the good news about this kind of uh, emphasis and, and attention to this insect decline issue is we really started thinking of, about this in a kind of cohesive way. Um, but one of the things you'll find from all of these views is a lack of tropical data. Um, so this is a study on insects and recent climate change. Um, you can see lots of different long-term studies on insects, but you only have two, one in Costa Rica, one in Ecuador. Um, from the tropics. So in terms of evidence or even just data about how tropical insects are responding to climate change, we, we have um, depressingly little knowledge about what's happening. So is there a cause for concern? Um, and we can come at this from a few different ways. Um, and when I started my PhD, um, I was kind of looking through the literature and trying to think about this question from a uh, um, kind of a theory perspective. And I came across this paper by George Stevens, George Stevens about Rappaport's rule. And I was, as I was reading through the paper, I came across this quote. Um, so climate change is a minor, is minor to an organism from a high latitude, is a major possibly life-threatening change to an organism from a lower latitude, even though the magnitude of the change in climate is the same. And when I read this in this paper from 1989, I had to read it, you know, five or six times. And I circled it a bunch of times and I went, whoa, if this is real, this is uh, potentially a big deal. Um, of course, climate change in this context from 1989 is not the climate change as we think of it. This was in reference to different geographic gradients and in, in, in climate. Um, but it, it occurred to me that the logic might hold to contemporary climate change. And the logic that flowed from this was this issue of Janssen's hypothesis and variation of temperature, which Benita uh, referred to. And it was a few weeks after I read this paper and started thinking about doing something, my PhD on this, um, that a, a young postdoc by the name of Curtis Deutsch um, came and gave a talk uh, at my university and then talked about this research, which is now this kind of famous paper um, that everyone refers to when we think about climate change in tropical ecotherms. Um, so his research showed that if you take like a thermal performance curve and kind of a modeling perspective and, and fit that to empirical data, you find that under a warming scenario in 2100, you get all this blue, which is a negative impact, a predicted negative change in fitness for tropical uh, insects in this case, um, which kind of... Uh, 
solidified and, 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 and verified this kind of claim by Stevens and Jansen um, that, and put it into this contemporary climate change um, scenario. So the short answer is yes, there's cause for concern. So I started thinking about this and then I started really buckling down on this for my PhD. Um, but I wanted to kind of dig into this within the context of butterflies and see if we could look at this from a more biophysical standpoint and also to think about it from that kind of uh, ecophysiological standpoint of a, of a butterfly. Um, and so I studied this butterfly, Clocyne lacinia. Um, I went to field sites in North America and in Central America. I collected a bunch of uh, butterfly data, a bunch of climate data. Um, and this, just for comparison, is the Deutsch model. So this is just based on air temperature and this kind of thermal performance curve framework. And you can see that negative blue predicted, predicted by the model. But then I use the data that I collected on this butterfly to say, well, OK, what if instead of using variation in air temperature, we used variation in the body temperature of the butterfly? Of course, that's the more relevant, relevant thermal parameter for any organism than air temperature. And that's going to be a consequence of a lot of different things. But first and foremost, solar radiation. Right? So if you're an organism and you're out in the sun, you're going to heat up a lot quicker than if you're in the shade. Um, so building that into the model, and then a very simple behavioral mechanism as well. Um, and the behavioral mechanism I put in the model is when it reaches the hottest temperatures, just avoid the sun which will lower the body temperature, we can then rerun this model and see what happens. And when you do that, it looks quite a bit different. First of all, all the blue's gone. So basically, just based on the biophysics and the behavior, um, you can kind of avoid the, most, uh, the worst parts of warming impacts. Um, you can also see it's a lot easier for insects in North America to kind of increase their fitness um, based on this simple model. All right. So that's all old history. <laughs> That's my PhD, which was, was quite a while ago. But I'm, I'm showing that just to kind of give you a perspective of where I'm coming from a lot of these questions, at, which is from this theoretical standpoint, and then trying to find data to better understand it and fit it to empirical case studies. Um, so my lab has been kind of digging into this um, question. And so this is the outline, and we'll think about resilience or ruin. Um, and in this case, I want to talk about a few different studies. One is looking at thermal tolerance and plasticity. And so this is examining this question from a kind of evolutionary um, standpoint. And it's something that I was thinking about a lot during my PhD, and I always wanted to dig into it. And so we had an opportunity to do that in, in the system, which I'll talk about in a minute. I'll then talk about diurnal and nocturnal thermal regulation. This is from a kind of organismal um, standpoint. And then I'll talk lastly about some tropicalization and species redistribution patterns which is at a more of a community standpoint based on data in Hong Kong. So the first study about evolutionary, um, the kind of evolutionary perspective, thinking about thermal uh, tolerance, this is work largely done by Michel Dongmo. Uh, Michel, uh, I co-supervised him during his PhD at the University of Yaoundé One in Cameroon. Um, and he later did a postdoc with me at Hong Kong. And so we wanted to use this butterfly. This is by Cyclist Dorothea. And we were in inspired by a lot of research by um, different people looking at plasticity of Bicyclus aninana. And Klaus has done some great research on um, thermal tolerance and, and aninana. And we decided, okay, well, we want to develop a system for a different butterfly in Central Africa <laughs> and just do the same thing. So we'll just apply the protocols and it failed miserably. <laughs> it took us a few years to figure out the life history of the species, even though it's a congener, it should have been simple, it wasn't. Um, but eventually we figured out kind of the, the key life history things. Um, once we figured out the life history of the species, we could then um, apply it and test out these different um, theories which we were interested in. In particular, Bicyclist Dorothea and a lot of Bicyclist species in Cameroon and in Central Africa, um, they persist along this gradient of forest, kind of lowland tropical forest in the southern part of Cameroon. And then you get into this transitionary forest savanna mosaic, which we call the ecotone. So the ecotone is a lot more open, um, and there are patches of forest instead of a more kind of homogenous tropical uh, tropical lowland forest system. 
And so what we wanted to do is we wanted to take populations of Physicus dorothea from two ecotone populations and two forest populations. Um, these are quite far away, so this is for scale. These are you know, 200 kilometers away from each other. Um, and just to kind of prove to you that there are these thermal differences between forest and ecotone, um, this is diurnal variation in temperature from Ebo Forest, forest site, and then this is Banjara, which is an ecotone site. So there's quite a bit more variation in temperature, and the ecotone tends to get higher. And so we wanted to test whether this kind of variation in thermal, um, thermal variation had any consequences for the thermal tolerance of the species. So we took Dorothea populations from these sites, we brought them to the lab, we reared them out, we wanted to get rid of the kind of under any underlying um, acclimation effects, um, maternal effects. Um, and then we measured CT max um, for males and females. And we found that the ecotone CT max is higher um, for the ecotone populations versus the forest populations, which was kind of our, our anticipation, our anticipated result. Well, one of the tricky things about CT max and thermal tolerance studies is, well, what does this mean? What's, what's the relevance for this for, for an organism? Um, and to kind of get at this question a little bit, we looked at microclimate data. Um, so this is modeled microclimate data from forest in red and blue in ecotone. This is the average CT max, this horizontal line. The solid line is 0% shade on the ground. So the, the temperature on the ground in 0% shade, uh, you can see it's, it tracks pretty close in some parts of the year close to the, the thermal tolerance, or in some cases, it exceeds the thermal tolerance. Um, so, and it, it is higher in the ecotone as well. So it gives some suggestion that maybe this is ecologically relevant. But if you look at all of these lines, <laughs> this is uh, 120 centimeters and, or 100% shade. So basically the butterfly, all it has to do is find some shade or increase its vertical height and it can get pretty well under 30 degrees. So again, it comes back to this kind of issue about thermal regulation and finding the appropriate microhabitats. Um, and in a lot of those cases, they can then avoid the worst of the thermal tolerance limits. Um, okay, so what about plasticity? And this is something that um, we're, we're still trying to finish off. Uh, it's been kind of a beast of a project, but it's a lot of fun. So. In this case, we focused on one site each of um, Indica Minike is an ecotone site, and then Somalomo is a forest site. In this case, we looked at uh, four bicyclist species, including Dorothea. We took wild butterflies, we reared them for one generation, and then we split up uh, individuals into 20 degree treatment and a 30 degree treatment to see how this developmental temperature might affect thermal tolerance. And we did that for fifth instar larvae and adults, and we did CT min and CT min and CT max for all those things. And the results they look like this. So this is uh, CT max here. So this is the temperature at which the adult butterfly or the larvae basically stop moving. Um, and the first thing you can see is if reared at twenty versus thirty, you do tend to get an increase. So. Um, the thermal tolerance tends to be higher if they're reared under higher conditions, which again, um, fit our, ex our expectations. Um, but the green is the forest, the yellow is the, the ecotone, and you can see there are some differences as to where they came from. So it's most obvious in Bulgaris, uh, so you can see in the forest population, there's no difference between 20 and 30, so there's basically no plasticity in thermal tolerance. Uh, but in the ecotone, there is, um, and that's, you know, three or four degree difference. Uh, we were unable to rear out forest of bicyclists and house. We don't know why, um, but that is also an interesting kind of side tangent. Okay, so we can put everything together. This is delta CT. So this is the difference between this and this. Um, and this is larva. This is adults. These are for the four species. The main thing I want to get across here is that you can see for the ecotone populations, um, the plasticity, that change between uh, the developmental temperature, it's always higher in ecotone, except for CT min by cycles vulgaris. There's one exception. But in general, we, we tend to, to see higher plasticity and thermal tolerance um, for um, 
the, the bicyclists in the ecotone. So in answer to this first question about resilience or ruin, I, for me, the kind of main interpretation of this is that there is some resilience for ecotone. There is some evidence that um, thermal tolerance is higher, there's higher plasticity for um, the populations in, in the ecotones. And also kind of more broadly, it demonstrates that even within one species, you have quite a bit of variation um, in, in thermal tolerance and how these organisms are dealing uh, with these types of temperatures. I think that's good news from this kind of resilience or ruinous um, perspective. The second thing I want to talk about is diurnal and nocturnal thermal regulation. So this is something I, I when I got to Hong Kong, I started thinking about moths and studying moths. And then I started getting interested in, in thermal regulation between moths and butterflies. Uh, and somehow I convinced uh, Yud Feng Ling, who is a finishing PhD student in my lab, to actually take up this challenge. And so we wanted to look at uh, butterflies and moths in Hong Kong. And there's surprisingly little on this, actually. Um, but there is one kind of classic paper in Lepidoptera Thermoregulation by Harry Clench. Um, and he characterizes the kind of thermal regulatory strategies of butterflies in this way. So butterflies tend to be heliotherms. Um, they depend on solar heat. They have small bodies to avoid overheating, uh, restricted diurnal activity. Versus moths, which tend to be myotherms, they tend to depend on muscular heat. They have thick bodies to conserve heat and then restrict it to nocturnal activities. So we wanted to see, does this make sense? Does this track with the, the data that we collect on this? And to get at this, um, Fung applied a protocol which is uh, very commonly used in lizards, not so much in insects, um, but we felt it would be a good way to kind of get at this question in our case. <laughs> So here you have a, kind of a general thermal performance curve with CT min and CT max. Um, but along this gradient, you have the field body temperature, so the, the body temperature of the butterfly or moth. Um, you then have the habitat temperature, the operative temperature, so that's the, you know, or the microclimate temperature, if you want to call it that. Um, and then there should be some kind of optimal temperature range. So the temperature where the butterfly or moth is the happiest, where it wants to be, which of course that's going to be very different from C2 to C2 max. Well, so to get at this, it was actually took quite a bit of methodological development that uh, Fung did, and he gets all the credit for this. Um, so for field body temperature, we used a thermal imaging camera. Um, he did a lot of calibration to make sure that we were. Uh, getting decent measures of field body temperature through the thermal imaging camera. We also then used operative temperature. We use these uh, felt models. There they are. So basically, you, you put these felt models out, and they kind of mimic uh, uh, they're kind of fake butterflies in some way. Um, and we have different colors of the felt model. Um, to we have light and dark. Um, and we put we can the nice thing about this is you can put it in available and selected habitats. And again, a lot of calibration to make sure that we're um, getting some semblance of uh, a predicted butterfly body temperature. This is one of my favorite things about Fung study. Uh, we measured preferred temperature of the butterflies and moths through this uh, thermal arena. So it's hot here, it's cool here. You drop the butterfly or moth here doesn't like being hot, and so then it moves towards cooler, and then you figure out where it stops. You say, okay, that's that's its preferred temperature. Um, and we did that different under different lighting conditions. Um, we did a lot of different control experiments. Um, yeah, it turns out this is very hard to measure in Lepidoptera, but uh, interesting stuff. I'll show that in a minute. So Fong went out um, for six months in Hong Kong, ultimately recorded over 400 individuals of 146 species. Critically, he sampled in the day and at night. Um, so of course we want moth information and we want butterfly information. So poor Fung had to uh, sample just all the time. <laughs> all right, so here are the results. Um, and I'll walk you through it. There's a lot going on here, um, but it's all kind of captured in this, this graph. So we have wet season and dry season. 
In the wet season, we have the red, which are the butterfly field body temperatures. The blue are the moth field body temperatures. And this is obviously the time that we recorded them. The gray bars are the operative temperatures. So those are the felt models. I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. I'll set that aside for now. And then these dashed lines are the preferred temperature of the diurnal butterflies and then the preferred temperature of moths. So we didn't really see any difference in the preferred temperature of butterflies and moths, um, which was counter to my expectation. I thought, thought we would get more from that. But, but what it does give you a sense for is, is this kind of range of temperatures where the butterflies and moths want to be. And what you see is that in the wet season, the butterflies actually tend to be a little bit above the preferred temperature range. The moths are dead smack in the middle of it. So the moths are, are kind of sitting where they want to be in terms of the, the preferred temperature. That changes quite a bit in the dry season. So in the dry season, you see more variation for the butterflies. For the moths, uh, you start to see some temperatures which are below the preferred temperature. Uh, well, we can't, I don't know for sure, but still probably reasonably above uh, the CT then for a lot of these moths. Um, okay, let's look at the operative temperature. And, and so this, again, uh, thanks to Benita's talk, and I don't have to orient you really, because this is the same kind of approach. So this is air temperature, and this is field body temperature. But we took a slightly different perspective. So instead of uh, looking at kind of species or family effects, which, which are important, um, in this case, we were more just interested in the difference between the butterflies and the moths. Um, so Instead, we use these uh, the, the operative temperatures and compare the dark operative temperatures to the field body temperatures, and then the, the white operative temperatures to the field body temperatures. And when we do that, you see this really interesting relationship with the dark operative temperature and the field body temperature, which is the moths are pretty much straight on this line, so they're not, they're not doing much. The butterflies, are also on this line until you get to about 35 degrees. And then we, we see the segmented uh, break in the regression. Um, so the, the temperatures tend to be well below this kind of prediction regarding the, the black operative temperature and field body temperature. So it suggests that for dark butterflies at least, <laughs> they're, they're doing something to lower their body temperatures um, to below what it would be um, otherwise. All right, so what does all this mean? The first thing which I think is interesting is that nighttime microhabitats are thermally suitable for nocturnal moths in the tropics. Um, certainly in the case of Hong Kong, I suspect this is broadly, more broadly true in the tropics as well. Um, so the clench kind of paper is great. It gives us a sense and, and um, I think it's a helpful starting point for understanding thermoregulation, but it's very temperate biased, right? So he's thinking of, really cold nights in, in the US or Europe. Um, whereas, you know, for our system, the moths, they don't, they don't really have to do anything. They're, they're pretty happy from, come a, from a strict kind of thermal biology perspective. Um, what that means for climate change implications for moths, not sure. Uh, there are lots of different issues and caveats, um, but there is def definitely a difference regarding thermal regulatory consequences of butterflies and moths and climate change. The second thing is that diurnal insects do have to cope with stressful daytime heat. Um, and it looks like they do have some mechanisms to, to deal with that. And again, um, very complimentary to uh, Benita's results. Um, so that's, again, some good news in terms of um, organismal responses to warming or to climate change. I've been looking at this question. This is a paper I published a few years ago on small mammals. Um, and it's just a modeling study uh, where we looked at this. Um, in this case, we used uh, metabolic scope. Um, and using metabolic scope, we can look at kind of latitudinal variation um, in, uh, in kind of thermal suitability of, of mammals and controlling for um, morphology. And what you see is that, again, in the, in the tropics, mammals, small mammals, 
all else being equal, are going to be happiest, are going to be most active at night, um, just from kind of a strict thermal physiology perspective. Um, whereas that flips at higher latitudes, you're going to be happier during the day. Now, again, you can we know that <laughs> morphology is important and that can it can flip that pattern. Um, but I think it's really important to think about these kind of axes of activity and vulnerability and, and exposure. So you have diurnal variation in temperature, you have latitudinal variation in temperature, and important interactions in those things. So in terms of this question about resilience or ruin, um, for me, it suggests that maybe there is some resilience for, uh, at least for Lepidoptera, for nocturnal Lepidoptera. Um, and um, that's good news because most Lepidoptera are nocturnal, most Lepidoptera are moths. Um, but um, yeah, I think this is, we need more research on this question about uh, nocturnal insects in particular. The final thing I wanna talk about is this question about tropicalization and species redistribution. So this is back in Hong Kong. Uh, we have this really weird and kind of interesting issue where we have increasing numbers of butterflies. So these are all butterfly species that have shown up in Hong Kong from 2007 to 2011. It's persisted. We have a new species in Hong Kong about every year. Um, and so the question is, why, why? Why do we keep having new butterflies show up in Hong Kong? Um, whenever a new species shows up in the media, it's always climate change. <laughs> um, maybe it's climate change. Uh, but I suspect it's more complicated than that. And so we wanted to kind of dig into this question about are communities changing? What are the drivers that are pushing or, or pushing these species into Hong Kong? And, and just to make the point, this is Letha chandica. This is this species. Um, these are not like little lysenids that we've, we've missed for decades or something. These are you know, big butterflies that <clears throat> no one in their right mind would have missed, but now they're they're pretty abundant. So these are big changes, but we don't know what's driving these big changes. To look at this question, uh, we were fortunate to um, get two data sets. Uh, so one from Feng Yun Butterfly Reserve and one from Sheng Moon Butter Butterfly Garden. Um, I should uh, also point out, this is also researched by Feng, um, also part of his PhD. So we have 13 years of data in Feng Yun, 19 years of data in Sheng Moon. So it's kind of a unique data set for, for tropical systems and butterflies. And then we've developed this database of about 300,000 records of over 3,000 species. Um, and we can use this database to reference the kind of climatic niche of all of these species and look at change over time. Um, so I just want to pause for a minute, because this has actually taken me a lot of time and I could, I could spend another half an hour on this, <laughs> I won't. Um, but we've been trying to uh, curate and, and aggregate this data of butterfly distributions in tropical Asia. Um, this is work by Emily Jones and Eugene Yao, who are uh, PhD students in my lab. You can see from this data set, if we look at the occurrence records and the sampling intensity, they're big gaps. Um, so I'm not super happy with it, but I am happy enough that I am comfortable using it. But it took us some time to um, uh, to find a data set we were comfortable with. Because if you just download GBIF data, you get weird results. <laughs> um, with that, you can do like stack distribution models and all sorts of other fun stuff. But the key thing, that we can use it for in this case is we can use these occurrence records to calculate species temperature indices. So if we have a new butterfly in Hong Kong that has a natural distribution here in our data set versus a distribution here, um, it will change. This will be cooler, this will be warmer. So we can see how the kind of biogeographic affiliations are changing over time. So this is done very commonly in Europe and we, we see lots of clear, consistent changes increases in the so-called community temperature index um, that reflect those changes. So we wanted to see if that was the case in our system as well. So long story short, yes and no. <laughs> so this is the Fung Yun Butterfly Reserve. We do see an increase 
and CTI. Um, interestingly, there's some curious seasonal effects, which we're not quite sure what to make of. Um, but it's most the increase in CTI is most obvious in winter and in spring. Um, for summer and autumn, there isn't much of a change at all. In Shing Moon, uh, there's no change at all. There's, it's a completely flat line. Again, curiously, a bit of an increase in spring, uh, which is statistically significant, but not sure what to make of it in the context of everything else. Um, but sort of a, uh, an inconsistent answer. One of the things which comes out, though, when you're doing analyses like this is it's not just a climate effect. So even if you do see changes in community temperature index, it could be a consequence of habitat. So in our data sets, for example, woodland species tend to have a lower species temperature index than the other species. So maybe if we're seeing an increase in CTI in Feng Yun, maybe it's just because the, but the habitat's opening and you have more habitat open species that's driving the community pattern upwards. Fortunately, uh, Baller and Ben and Gase uh, developed this technique to correct for that. Um, so we applied that correction. You can see the red in Feng Yun, it's, it's not as steep. Um, so it suggests that there probably is some habitat effect, but we still do see an increase, which again may provide some evidence that there's a, a climatic influence. Doesn't really change the story at all for Shin Moon. And then the last thing for this result is we broke down the data set and did an inval analysis. So this just identifies the species that are, are most characteristic of different time periods. So we have an early time period, which is before 2014, and then after 2014. And then we can look at our two data sets and see which species are kind of indicating the two, two time periods. Um, so for Feng Yun, we have 14 species which are uh, come out in the inval. Five of them are new to Hong Kong, so have established since 2000. This is one of them. This is Lexius pardalis. You see it everywhere in Hong Kong. Um, very beautiful butterfly. This is, I found this on campus, actually. <laughs> um, and then in Shen Moon, we only have four species, and again, two are new to Hong Kong. Um, so it does suggest that there are these interesting community changes and that these new species that have been establishing in Hong Kong are actually driving some of that community change. So just in terms of the, the kind of punchline for that part of the story is we are seeing some of these tropicalization patterns, changes in species redistribution in the tropics. Um, habitat is a key interactive factor but we also see some evidence that climate is probably also an important driver. Okay, so I wanna get to this question and kind of answer the larger point, which is resilience or ruin. Um, but before that I do that, I wanna take a couple of different quick detours. Um, one has to do with this issue that I mentioned in the beginning, uh, which is, we, we still don't have a lot of data from the tropics. So I've shown you a couple of uh, ways we can maybe get around that. We can hopefully use theory to, to, um, to get us out of that, that hole a little bit. But the fact of the matter remains, we just don't have the data in the tropics that we really need um, to get at some of these conservation questions. Um, and this is a paper, um, by Michel Dongmo, so he did all that bicyclist thermal tolerance work. And in the course of that research, um, Michel and I would have beers and uh, he would just complain about, oh, there's so much corruption here, I, we can't do anything. And oh, I would love to go to this site, but there's too much conflict. And oh, I'm working with this community and it's just impossible. Um, and eventually I said, all right, just put it, write a paper about it. Maybe, maybe other people will be interested in your uh, opinion other than just me over beers. Um, and I really love this paper because it's uh, it has Michelle's very unique voice. And I think he makes a lot of interesting points, which I think are, are really critical and important, um, with a focus on Central Africa and Lepidoptera. But I think it, it kind of, it's more broad than that. And there isn't a whole lot as scientists that we can do about corruption, cash, and conflicts. Um, but there is a lot that we can do about collections and collaboration. Um, so one of the points that Michelle makes is that there 
or no collections really to speak of at all regarding Lepidoptera in Central Africa. So if he wants to look at a reference collection, which just doesn't exist. Um, lots uh, in Europe and the US, uh, but none in the country. Um, actually, uh, I'm, I'm pleased to be here because I know a, a lot of people in this institute um, are, are, are making really strong progress in this area. Um, and actually the, the um, highlight in particular in Central Africa uh, Robert Tropic's uh, research and, and efforts to kind of increase uh, local capacity. So I think there it's it's not all bad news. <laughs> there are some some good examples and and some progress that we're making in this area. But this is something that as I kind of get on in my career, I'm I'm kind of more interested in, in some of these aspects and, and seeing if we can do something about that because I think that may actually um, provide some of the more long term impacts that we need to address conservation issues. The other thing, which there's no time to talk about, but if anyone's curious, um, <laughs> I know I'm in the Institute of Entomology, so you may not be a lot of people interested in pangolins, um, but yeah, I've been doing a lot of research on pangolins for several years. Um, and in the past few years, I've been focusing pretty intensively on wildlife trade and pangolins and SARS related uh, coronaviruses and all these interesting things. And there's just a bunch of wild mixture of interesting ecology, public health, conservation issues. So if anyone's curious about that um, and wants their ear talked off, let me know. Okay, finally, to the punchline of the, of the talk. So climate change and tropical inse uh, insects, resilience or ruin. I think that tropical insects may be more resilient to warming than we initially believed. What I mean by that is when we started getting some of these studies like the Deutsch paper and, and, and other papers along those lines, there was, there was a you know, big concern about tropical insects. I actually think there's a lot of reason to be optimistic um, that they, they may be quite resilient to warming impacts. And again, I think uh, some of Benita's research supports, um, supports that claim. But there's one really, really important caveat, and that's that we need the habitats. Um, so one thing that you may have recognized throughout the throughout my talk, okay. mentioning about forests or ecotone, all these things, those habitats, the variation of those habitats, I think are really essential in terms of providing escape from warming, in, in, in terms of providing uh, uh, diversity and, and, and tolerance and these other things. And so I think if we, we conserve habitats and we, we protect the habitats, then I think uh, the insects will have this uh, kind of enhanced capacity to respond to any warming impacts. Um, but I think if we lose the habitats, then I don't think that's actually true. Then I think we probably can't expect uh, a ruinous demise. That's it. Thanks. Happy to answer any questions. You <laughs> oh yeah, I can start. <laughs> yes, please. Yeah, thank you very much for your talk. Um, just one point I didn't understand fully. You mentioned in the second part that the nocturnal butterflies yeah. have uh, some re resilience. Yeah. Um, but uh, I hope I <laughs> recall correctly. I mean, this is probably because of the diurnal butterflies simply they have higher peaks, right? Uh, in the environment, peak temperatures. Uh, because yes. the break point, so it was actually the diurnal butterflies better at buffering, right? Yes. yes. The, the others are fully following basically That's right. ambient temperature. The, the yeah. So I would be inclined to say, um, the the diurnal have a higher resilience because they seem to have some mechanisms to buffer against um, detrimentally high body temperature, isn't that? You can sort of correct. You can interpret it that way. <laughs> okay. 
Um, yes, no, that, that's a great point and it's something that we've thought about. Um, and that was actually, I must say, that was kind of when I initially went into this study, that's what I was thinking. I was thinking moths, if you're in a nocturnal, butterflies can, they can find shade, they can uh, avoid sun, they can do all this stuff to kind of change their body temperature and regulate their body temperature. Moths, when they're active at night, there's not a whole lot they can do. It's temperature is kind of the temperature and they, they um, you know, if it gets too hot, they, they can't really do much to cool down. They can shiver, I guess, but, um, or not shiver, that, that would warm them up. <laughs> uh, yeah, there really isn't much they can do to kind of cool down. Um, but then when we actually got the data and I, and I saw that most of the butterflies, or butterflies, most of the moths are kind of within that preferred temperature range. It occurred to me that, well, actually, I mean, if you have a couple of degrees of warming, uh, they're still largely in their preferred temperature. Um, so that's the only reason why I said, when I look at this, it strikes me that maybe moths are okay, or or at least more resilient in some sense than the butterflies, because they're they're kind of closer to the, the hotter temperatures. But you're absolutely right. The other thing, which I didn't go into detail, but I've been thinking about a lot and I don't have a good answer for, is this is, we do have a little bit of data of butterflies in their inactive state. So this is, you can see the red spots, which are the butterflies at night. I, I still don't know why, like moths, which I guess are just really good at hiding during the day, but we, we don't have any inactive state of moths. Um, and so I think inactive states are also a really important part of understanding this kind of nocturnal diurnal dichotomy is there may very well be um, key kind of thermal vulnerability of moths in their inactive state during the day. Um, and we don't have good data on that. Yeah. I was just wondering about the methodology of that. Paper, yeah. <clears throat> all that work with the moths. So how did you affect the body temperatures of the moths that night? Uh, the thermal imaging camera. Okay. So and they would be perched or they would also be flying. So most of our data is well, we have both flying and non-flying. Yeah. We didn't see a huge difference in this data between the flying and non-flying. Which is interesting, I guess, right? Because we would expect them to be quite different. Yeah. I guess there's some difference in the butterflies in the wet season. That's interesting, yeah. But not nothing with the moths. Questions? Yeah. Yeah, uh, I'm still thinking about you know, the, the day temperatures for the nocturnal, for the morning. Yeah. That's actually, yeah. I mean, if they sit somewhere and yeah. sleep and then it's getting amazingly hot. Yeah. But probably, I mean, occasionally you do see more flying also. I mean, not the day yes. flying, but so probably it's really getting critically hot, they would probably move, right? That'd uh, be my guess. In daytime. And, and then it's probably the eggs again, which are really the critical stage, right? Yeah. Where? Well, yeah, so the, I showed a little bit in Michelle's study, <clears throat> we really wanted to get at this question about uh, larvae. Yeah. And in our case, in this case, the, it's basically the same story in the larvae and adults. Um, uh, but, you know, one important caveat is this is late in star larvae. Um, and if we we had trouble <laughs> calculating or estimating uh, CT max with, um, with the early in stars, because a lot of them die, which gives you a, an idea of maybe that's the, <laughs> the sensitive stage. Um, so yeah, that's all in a lot of these kinds of studies, certainly in, in my work, um, it's, a, it's a big caveat. <clears throat> 